Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here. I just want to thank the Breakthrough Initiative, uh, Avi Loeb, and the conference organizers for allowing me to be part of this very exciting and special week in some small way. So thank you. Um, while the space between us and 550 AU and beyond is an ocean that's brimming with space debris, uh, not only are there very large objects like asteroids and comets, uh, but much of this material is in the form of much smaller particles on the orders of microns that we astronomers like to call dust. Now, some of this material is the leftover from the origins of the, the solar system, um, and some of this is newly created dust uh, from collisions with asteroids and comets, for instance. But either way, um, interstellar and interplanetary dust is potentially very hazardous for any mission that we send out to 550 AU and beyond. So it behooves us to think about, to, to learn and understand as much as we can about the nature of interstellar dust. And before I dive in, I just want to acknowledge the Breakthrough Starshot team um, at Harvard, AKA Avi's group. Um, Leading up to this week, um, all of us have been thinking a lot about the potential risks of dust and other uh, possible challenges for the mission. And uh, about half of us are here this week. So my outline is as follows. I'm going to first paint a picture in broad sketches of what we think we know about interstellar dust and what remains unknown. Next, I want to outline some of the risks we can encounter in a mission to 550 AU. And finally, I want to show you a vision of how a future space mission to the outer solar system might not only be risky, but rewarding as well. So my focus today is going to be on the density and size distribution of interstellar dust grains. That is, how much and how big are the particles that could collide with our spacecraft. But I want you to be aware of the bigger picture, too. Uh, in addition to dust, a space mission could be con should be concerned with protecting itself from ionized particles, magnetic fields, and the cosmic ray background. So the most recent actual images we have that tell us about the size and chemical composition of dust grains uh, comes from NASA's Stardust mission. The particles are made up of heavy elements like iron, silicon, calcium, and magnesium. And the size of most particles appears to be on the order of the wavelength of microns or optical light. It just shows that some of the abundances of uh, shows some of the abundances of elements in the local interstellar cloud, which is a region surrounding our sun. The Stardust mission, however, had the very specific objective of collecting dust from near a comet, and it didn't go that far, just a few AU. So this cartoon is meant to give you a sense of what the local interstellar medium looks like around the sun. We're enveloped in what's been termed a local interstellar cloud, having a particle number density of about 0.2 per cubic centimeter. And we neighbor another cloud of gas and dust called the G cloud, um, which could extend to 1,000 AU and perhaps even further, all the way up to Alpha Sen. And we don't know about much about the properties of the G cloud, but you can see that if we go in one direction, we would have to pass through it to get to 550 AU. And we can avoid it um, on our way to Alpha Centauri. And besides the G cloud and the local interstellar cloud, there are perhaps a dozen other similar clouds in one way or another, um, all of which are enveloped in a hot, tenuous medium called the local bubble. So this is another cartoon of the local interstellar medium that I just grabbed off of Wikipedia. It gives us a more three-dimensional uh, view of the local interstellar medium. The arrows indicate the directions of motions of the clouds. And in this picture, you can already see some minor discrepancies in the position of the sun with respect to the LIC and the G cloud from the previous slide. Um, but the reason why I like to show these two pictures is because I'm sort of reminded of those ancient maps of the world where the continents you know, were all distorted based compared to what we know today. And uh, this is just a reminder that um, as much as we know about our galaxy and beyond, as much as we know about the universe, our own backyard is very um, uncharted territory in many respects. 
So in our galaxy, there's evidence that most phases of the interstellar medium have a gas-to-dust ratio of about 100. But in the local ISM, there's the caveat that gas and dust may not be well mixed, and a standard gas-to-dust ratio may not apply. But that being said, we have to do the best that we can. And if we apply this gas-to-dust ratio to the atomic number density, we get an average volume density of about 3 by 10 to the negative 24 kilograms per cubic meter of dust. And keep in mind that this global average breaks down further when we think about the specific size and mass distribution of dust particles. So most of the data that we have on the size and mass distribution of dust grains in the solar system comes from the Ulysses and the Galileo missions. Uh, the Ulysses mission found a mean particle mass of about 3 by 10 to the negative 16 kilograms. And uh, this corresponds to particles on the order of 3 tenths of a micron if we assume um, a certain density and, and chemical uh, composition of the dust. Uh, so these histograms uh, just show the distribution of uh, the mass distribution of dust particles in the inner solar system. And again, the point to emphasize here, as you can see, is that all of our data is for the very inner regions of the solar system, just within a, a few AU, about 5 AU. The other point to make from this plot is that the high mass end is not well constrained at all. And so uh, we may get, be getting dust particles that have masses up to 10 to the to the negative 11 kilograms, corresponding to about 10 microns in size. So given that um, there's still so much unknown observationally, um, especially about the nature of outer solar system dust, um, simulations and modeling can be a potentially fruitful way of, of learning more, um, or at least placing constraints on the nature of, of dust in the outer solar system. So this author, Pop, uh, from UC Berkeley, I believe, modeled the dust in the solar system for four different contributions and for four different sized dust grains. Uh, so the first column here is for uh, Jupiter-type or Kuiper Belt-type uh, dust grains. Uh, the second column is for Jupiter-type comet dust grains. Uh, the third column is for dust grains uh, originating from Halley-type comets. And the fourth column is from dust originating from the Oort cloud. And the four rows are for four different size distributions from one micron to 100 micron. And basically, we're just looking at the density distribution in the ecliptic, in the plane of the, galaxy, of the solar system, rather. Uh, so this plot might be... Um, a little bit more helpful. This is by the same author. And in this case, we're just looking at the distribution of dust uh, for different size distributions and for different, uh, so from different sources versus heliocentric distance. And so this author modeled the three-dimensional distribution of dust, but what we're seeing in this plot is the distance from the sun within the plane. And so a step further, as a step further, it would be really useful to look at the three-dimensional distribution of dust because, if possible, we want to avoid where most of the dust is concentrated on any trajectory that we take with a future space mission. So a few of the risks, I think, as most of us can imagine, the worst case scenario is that dust um, and uh, an impact with the dust grain would completely destroy our spacecraft, depending on how large it is, or it might at least uh, destroy an instrument on board the spacecraft. But there are some lesser um, problems that, that are um, equally as worrying if they accumulate. Um, so one could be the deflection of a craft off its course, um, the erosion of the spacecraft over time if it's out there traveling for years. And if we're dealing with a high-speed uh, spacecraft, like for Starshot, um, we also have to consider charged dust grains. And so you potentially have surface charging, electronic sputtering, or photoelectric uh, emission if that charged dust grain comes into contact with your, with your chip. Um, other potential problems are you might cause the, uh, the chip to spin if it comes into, contract, into contact with, with the dust screen, sort of like a, a windmill, I suppose. So uh, what can we actually do based on our limited knowledge? Um, well, we can sort of 
do a back of the envelope calculation for the expected collision frequency, which is a uh, pretty straightforward uh, calculation, just depending on the number density of dust grains and the area and the velocity of the spacecraft. So just taking some numbers for small particles, for low mass uh, particles um, on the order of a tenth of a micron, um, and taking a spacecraft that's moving at about 50,000 kilometers per hour, this would yield a collision rate of about five collisions per hour. And as expected, um, your collision rate is going to go up as your number density increases. But the point of this really simple plot is that it's cumulative. So the low mass particles, um, we're going to get more hits from low mass, smaller grains, basically. But we also have to worry about collisions from high mass particles, even though they're going to be fewer they are potentially more devastating. And again, um, I just want to emphasize the point that this high mass end especially is pretty poorly constrained. Um, one other thing uh, that uh, simulations are particularly good for is uh, simulating the impact speeds of dust grains. We have to remember that we wouldn't be slamming into stationary objects. Uh, the Ulysses mission found that grains um, are moving from a few to tens of kilometers per second. And this is just an example of, of um, a simulated distribution of grain speeds for different sizes. So we have to protect ourselves. Uh, I'm just going to list some of the ideas that people have thought about over the years. Um, one is this idea of a particle cloud in which we could uh, sort of disperse a larger object that's potentially going to collide with us by uh, sending out an artificial spray of smart, smaller particles and, and dispersing the, the larger um, obstacle. Um, there's also magnetic shielding or radar sensing. Um, and then there's uh, solid shields, and uh, a number of people have thought about beryllium in particular. Uh, this particular calculation is for a very high-speed uh, spacecraft, but the point is we should be thinking about these types of calculations, um, thinking about how the material could potentially be eroded away over the course of years and um, perhaps do lab tests for the, the best material that's going to protect our spacecraft um, over the course of a long mission. And just one other idea that's uh, worth mentioning is this idea of a Whipple shield where we have sort of a, a cavity that's removed from the spacecraft and that's capable of absorbing and redirecting energy of the impacting particles. And so lastly, um, I just want to say that in spite of the, the risks and uncertainty of sending a telescope to 550 AU or beyond, there could be a number of rewards. Um, if a 550 AU mission were to precede Starshot, or if there were any other exploratory mission to investigate the nature of dust and other objects in the outer solar system, it could take in situ measurements of dust along the way. And that could uh, enable us to be more prepared for a successful voyage to Alpha Centauri. So just a bit about Alpha Centauri, um, as much as um, our own backyard is uncharted territory. The ISM around Alpha Centauri is even more unexplored and uh, more unknown to us. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it does lie in the direction of the G cloud. Um, and the sun, again, isn't in the G cloud. And so we can't assume that the properties of the local interstellar cloud within which the sun is embedded has the same properties as the G cloud. And so a 550 AU mission could probe the G cloud environment. And just a few numbers to give you an idea of what's going on, if the G cloud had a number density of 0.1 particle per cubic centimeter, then it would extend all the way up to Alpha Centauri. But if it has a higher density, just twice as much, its boundary wouldn't be enc encountered until about halfway to the star. Um, so as astronomers know, we don't really have information on the number density. We just have information on the column density along the line of sight. And lastly, uh, besides the utilitarian reasons for having an exploratory mission to investigate interstellar dust, such a mission would have scientific value in its own right, for it could teach us about the origins of our solar system and ultimately life on our planet. And with that, I'll leave um, my takeaway points for you. Thanks.
Thank you, Nia, for an excellent talk and for demonstrating that one can stand within the time limits. Uh, <laughs> so we have time for questions. Jim. shield and that is a, a diffuse plasma. You might get in contact with him about it. Where, where he's got to talk about it, but he never published it. Okay. Oh, and I should also mention the name, work of James Early on the impact of dust on thin films done at Livermore 15 to 20 years ago and then revisited five years ago. I can send you those papers. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Of course, for um, the Starshot the project, I, I think nobody experimented with uh, relativistic dust impact on the... Uh, uh, no, I mean, they did computer simulations, though. Uh-huh. So it turns out it puts a hole about one and a half times... Yeah. The well, at, at a tenth of the speed of light, basically, you are dealing with uh, similar... I mean, just like uh, radioactive uh, decay uh, products, um, because you have roughly 10 MeV per, per proton. If there are no more questions, thank you very much, Nia, and uh, we'll move on. Oh, there is one question? Oh, okay. Go ahead. I got it. Uh, great talk, Nia. Thank uh, you. Excellent, excellent. Um, so comparing the numbers that we've been going over uh, back and forth over the last few months, um, the, the number that appears, unfortunately, in the, some of the charts for the, uh, the mission parameters it needs to be updated. That's an old one. Um, we're getting about 400 now hits, and I think you were getting closer to, I think, 6,000? That's yeah. right, and I right. think you chose a slightly uh, larger grain size, which right. would have so a lower we, number density. Right, and so if I go to your grain size, 10, I get about 4,000, which is actually pretty mm -hmm. close to your 6,000. So I think we're in rough agreement now. Okay. now. We should go over that, but we should update the four numbers. Yeah, there is rough agreement between you and her, but we don't really know what the true answer is oh, yeah, yeah. until we go there. <laughs> Um, we have precision, but not accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Nia.